Dying is easy. Comedy is hard. People have noted Edmund Keane as the man who said this on his deathbed, but we're not actually sure if he really did. Anyway, the point stands. Everyone has their own opinion as to what is funny. And if you've ever read a YouTube comment thread, you'll see some people become bloodthirsty rage factories when something fails to make them laugh. For a show like South Park to become so widely considered some of the best TV created is truly special. And when Trey Parker and Matt Stone planned a foray into video games with South Park The Stick of Truth, I think everyone, including them, had the same question. If dying is easy and comedy is hard, where does designing a comedy video game fall on that scale? Before we start today's episode, I just want to announce a quick giveaway contest, if you will. You guys looking for one of these? This is the SNES Classic. Uh, I waited in line at midnight to get one of these extra ones. I had one pre-ordered at Best Buy and I went somewhere else to get one of these just for you guys. So. This is the SNES Classic. It comes with 21 games, including Star Fox 2, two controllers, all for a brand new television. And hey, I'm giving it away to you guys. And all you have to do is to go into the description down below and click that Gleamio link and make sure you sub to all of the channels and follow all the social medias associated to The Completionist, That One Video Gamer, Beard Bros, The Personal Channel, all that fun stuff. The more stuff you are subscribed to, the more your chances increase to winning this bad boy. We're gonna be announcing the winner in about four weeks from now, but you don't only just get this, you'll get this. You'll also get these two wireless controllers and you're gonna get this playing with superpower official uh, Nintendo Super NES classic book. Probably in it, it's got like maps and little fun development notes about the games. So you're gonna get all this for free. All you have to do once again is to go into the Gleamio link in the description down below, sign up, all that fun stuff, I hope you guys win. I'm sure someone has to win. Good luck, best of luck, and I hope you enjoy your SNES Classic. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of The Completionist. South Park The Fractured Butthole comes out this coming Tuesday. And honestly, I thought to myself, I really, really, really wanna talk about South Park The Stick of Truth. Now in terms of these games relations, I don't, I'm not sure if it's a sequel or a prequel, but either way, they're made by the same company in tandem with the creators of South Park. And I love South Park. It's my favorite animated show of all time. And I thought now is the best time to talk about South Park, the stick of truth. Let's begin. Yes. South Park started as a short in 1993 called Jesus vs. Frosty and was followed in 1995 with Jesus vs. Santa. Producer Doug Herzog saw the short, thought it was the funniest thing he'd ever seen, and brought the now notorious duo in to pitch the show. Matt and Trey asked one important question. How do you feel about talking poo? Comedy Central was receptive and the show was born. Believe it or not, the show itself was almost canceled before it even aired because of terrible responses from test audiences to the first episode, Cartman Gets an Anal Probe. Luckily, the short continued to grow as an internet sensation and legend has it, George Clooney even sent out tapes to his friends for the holidays. You could say that South Park was the first show the internet saved, predating Family Guy, Arrested Development, and I'm sure eventually we'll get Slam Ball back. Can we please have Slam Ball back? It's basketball on trampolines. Look at all the flips. When South Park was released, it came out guns blazing. It immediately became a hot button topic in the media. And as popularity grew, so did the unrelenting onslaught of vicious satire and sophomoric gags. By the end of the first season, South Park had been on the cover of Rolling Stone and Newsweek, as well as five articles in the New York Times. It was popular, divisive, and most of all, it had cultural significance not seen in animation since The Simpsons. So, as the Spider-Man movies taught us all, with great power comes great 
licensing. Just like any popular movie or show, licensed South Park merchandise flooded retail stores, plushies, bumper stickers, and of course, video games. In 1998, South Park the Game was released for the Nintendo 64. Up until this point, games based on TV shows were a mixed bag, as much as Jujubees are a mixed bag. A few good ones and a whole lot of gross. For every DuckTales, we would get four Grey's Anatomy. For every Simpsons hit and run, we would get five home improvements. And the original South Park game was... How do I put this? And then there was South Park Rally, a cart rip sad fest. Chef's Love Shack, a trivia game disguised as South Park. Then a passable tower defense game. And finally, an okay platformer. None of which were very well received. I must say though, the Chef's Love Shack theme was pretty great. You and me, and we know the rider. Simultaneous loving, baby. But before you head to the comments and post, I remember that game was awesome, you sick f reviews are for heads, you piece of ass. Then check with the people who really count. Listen to what Trey said in an interview with The Guardian. He said it was the disappointment with the older games that made us think, okay, if we ever do it again, we have to do it right, or at least intend to do it right. And when the PS3 and the Xbox 360 came out, we started talking about it. Once Trey and Matt saw the potential of the PS3 and the 360, they realized the game they wanted to make could look exactly like the show. And they didn't want to just give away the license anymore. They wanted creative control. South Park has not only referenced video games, but many episodes revolve around the medium itself. In one episode, Stan becomes a Guitar Hero star, and another takes place almost entirely in the world of Warcraft, which ended up becoming one of the most popular episodes of all time. Matt and Trey obviously love games. Trey felt that South Park would be best explored as an RPG, having stated at a Comic-Con panel that one of his favorite games was Earthbound. He wanted to capture the same feeling of kids exploring a fantastic world, but Parker and Stone quickly realized that they may have shot for the moon. It's estimated that Trey wrote 500 pages of perspective script for the game, and the developers had to beg them to chop it down. 500 pages. That's five movies. That's almost a full season of South Park. They may have been lucky enough to earn creative control over their own game, but it seemed like the universe would do everything it could to kill the project. Viacom, owner of Comedy Central, pulled funding after becoming less confident in video game sales. To follow, Microsoft had invested a large stake in Obsidian for something called Project North Carolina, which I imagine was a game about the production of sweet potatoes, the state's primary form of agriculture. I'd like to call it Yam Simulator 2017. Sorry, switched it off there for just a second. Despite being the greatest idea in the world, Microsoft canceled the project after seven months of development. This screwed Obsidian harder than the Japanese Beatles screw sweet potato crops. It forced them to drop around 30 employees, some of which were working on Stick of Truth, thus pushing the release date back. Then, to make matters worse, THQ, Obsidian's parent company and holders of the Stick of Truth rights, filed for bankruptcy. Forced to sell their assets, the Stick of Truth was to be auctioned off to the highest bidder. South Park Studios then sued, pushing the release date even further. And if they had won, possibly tanking the game entirely. Not cool, totally lame. Until along came Ubisoft. The game was saved, but the clouds hadn't parted yet. Ubisoft had major problems with Stick of Truth and demanded sweeping changes, again, pushing back the release date. This time to March 2014 for a total of five years of development time. Five years, that's 14 sweet potato crops. The success of the Stick of Truth was incredible to the point where a sequel was recently announced, South Park, The Fractured Butthole. The game was originally supposed to come out in March or April of this year, but was delayed until this very week. Surprise, surprise. I was one of the few that pre-ordered the game digitally for a good reason. If you pre-ordered it, you received a port of the Stick of Truth to your current console generation. So today, we are playing the PS4 port of South Park The Stick of Truth. But I'm really confident that this game is going to be perfect. Matt and Trey are perfectionists. Even everything they've done outside of South Park has been killed. I'm a big fan, so I'm pretty sure I'm going to laugh, but I'm also going to have my classy sensibilities challenged. Ah, who am I kidding? Bring on the anal probes. I mean, the anal probe jokes, not... 
I don't want... Anyway, I gotta be honest. This is their first game ever, so I'm not completely certain about the gameplay itself. Gaming is different from another form of entertainment. I'm intrigued to see if their genius can transcend mediums. Regardless, this game has been through hell, but in harsh environments, greatness can really emerge. Just like in acidic soil, sweet potatoes can... All right, you know, I'm, I'm really sick of this joke. I don't... Yeah, I, I don't... I doubt that anyone's even eaten a sweet potato before. South Park The Stick of Truth may as well be an official episode of the actual show. This game is hysterical and includes all of the favorite characters from the show without feeling forced. The RPG format lends itself well to this, allowing you to interact with most of the characters as they fit into the context of the plot. Randy, Cartman, Timmy all still have the jokes they're known for, but they don't feel rehashed or hacky. They interact and comment on the narrative and video games in general. In one scene, Jimmy stutters for a full minutes straight <laughs> Mag magical songs have been changing me with magical songs have been <laughs> Good lord, it killed me. At another point, Morgan Freeman enters and gives my favorite quote of the whole game. Because every time I show up and explain something, I earn a freckle. And guaranteed, it's going to push how comfortable you are playing this in front of your roommates or parents. Especially when you have to prove that a 10-year-old girl is a quote, lying two-faced bitch. You play as the new kid in town. The new kid is a silent protagonist, and this is very intentional. Trey Parker is obviously capable of writing great characters and dialogue, so why a silent main character? Well, in an interview, Trey Parker makes an interesting point. He felt that you put yourself in the main character's shoes, and when the character spoke through a dialogue tree, he thought, oh, that's not how I would say it. Despite if you agree or not, the silent main character bit is used very well, leading to a lot of funny moments. Having just moved to South Park, your parents encourage you to go out and make friends. Well, Facebook friends, the most important type of friends, obviously. Who wants friends who can't add to a total, thus proving your popularity, huh? Anyway, the game starts with you running into Cartman as they are playing their fantasy personas from the episode, The Return of the Fellowship of the Ring of the Two Towers. Cartman enlists the new kid in the retrieval of the Stick of Truth after Clyde loses it. Believing that Kyle and Stan have the stick, the new kid and Butters go off on a journey to retrieve it in what is essentially a game of capture the flag. Of course, in South Park, fashion, things escalate to the point of absurdity. Aliens kidnap the new kid and Randy Marsh, who is oddly comfortable with how much he's being probed, until the two mastermind the destruction of the alien ship. After crash landing, the government intercedes and the cover-up is awesome. The CIA covers up the ship in a small tarp and says it's under construction for a huge Taco Bell. The kids and the CIA both soon discover that there is an alien goo turning everything it touches into, well, Nazi zombies spouting Hitler's actual recording recorded speeches, and in true South Park fashion, it gets more vulgar and more strange from there. As previously said, in the first draft of the game, there were about 500 pages of script written, and it is noticeable. It's packed tip to toe with great lines and classic South Park expletive gymnastics. Trey Parker uses the word f like Bob Ross uses mountains and happy little trees. Welcome back to the joy of painting. When we last left off, we painted this beautiful mountain with some trees in the house, and now it's time to add some snow. We're just gonna take some of this white right here and just dab it, dab it all around. Doesn't that look pretty as a bastard? Oh, looks like we're gonna take this white and put on that house. Yeah. Yeah. Oh shit. Yeah. Yeah. All of your favorites make appearances here too. Mr. Hanky and his messed up wife, Al Gore and Man Bear Pig, Crab People, and even Chef. Of course, that last one is not so flattering. As you can see, if someone were to walk into the room while you were playing the game and didn't see the controller, they would think that this is just another episode of the show. Everything is there. The stiff body animations and exaggerated expressions give the characters an amazing amount of life and are precisely the way they are in the show. With the customization, your character would fit right into the series. The armor and weapons you find look great. They really represent the kid's childish play, as you will wear things like bathrobes and use weapons like darts and 
broken bottles. In fact, the designers from the game said they made some pretty cool looking gear, but Matt and Trey came in and said, make it look crappier. Thus, designing an improvised toolkit reminding me of the days when I would tape straws to the back of my hand and pretend that I was Wolverine. Or tape Janet McCurdy's face to a Furby and pretend I was iCarly. Don't you f***ing judge. To create a map for the first time ever, Matt and Trey had to figure out what the town of South Park would actually look like. What was the layout of this Denver suburb? In form true to the show, it was handled basically. The map of South Park is simple and walking to every area is no tremendous feat, but the world still feels full. Nothing says this more than the closets of the main characters like Cartman or Butters. If you check it out, it's packed with items relating to tons of episodes. The same goes for every wall of South Park. The team really found joy in painting the entirety of the game in South Park memorabilia, yet still leaving room for original sight gags to enjoy. The Stick of Truth's visual elements would be more than enough to create an immersive experience, but as much as the look of the game was cared for, so was the audio. The game was designed with brilliant surround sound in mind. In most houses, a television is on that's showing TV gags that are from the actual South Park show, usually Terrence and Phillip. As I walked across the room, the the sound of the TV panned across from my left ear to my right, as it would in real life. That just feels good. And I know I just described the basic functions of surround sound, but it's different when you're playing a game all about atmosphere. They say in film, video is two-thirds audio, and that is applied vividly. Lightning strikes and smashing attacks have real impact when a sound designer can make me sit back and make me go, wow, that vomiting sounds so crisp and resonant. <laughs> then you know they must have done something right. Now, the South Park boys have actually written three musicals if you count South Park Bigger, Longer, and Uncut, The Book of Mormon, and their first movie ever, Cannibal the Musical. Also, a ton of memorable songs were written for the original soundtrack to Team America. So I was anticipating great music, and that's what I got. Some classics, some completely new compositions, particularly the overworld theme is great. For cutscenes, they used their go-to guy, Jamie Dunlap, to create the usual South Park score and stings to fill the vibes. Overall, I never experienced any problems with the narrative and exhibition of the game. Each angle of the Stick of Truth has the same care and feel of every episode in the series. I know this may sound hyperbolic, but I honestly think the presentation is perfect. It's funny, smart while dumb, and a blend of horrifying and innocent childhood adventure, just like the show. It also hits every note of an RPG, and those notes are homage just as much as they are a parody. Even if the show truly offends one sensibilities, they would still have to admit that the way it's expressed is a completely successful execution of the developer's intent. Just like we all learned, there are no mistakes, only happy accidents. And we're finished. I think this would look kick-ass as shit above your bitchin' fireplace. Or you can hang it on your f***ing dick for all I f***ing care. Happy painting. God bless. The Stick of Truth is what happens when you take classic RPG mechanics, tweaked a bit for the sake of accessibility, and mix it with a wonderfully generous portion of toilet humor. It's apparent Parker and Stone know what works in these games. The ingredients are all there. A solid turn-based system, plenty of gear and pickups, several classes and strategies, diverse enemies, and a leveling system with multiple angles for developing your character. Although this was made by gamers, and many of the show's fans are gamers, I I think the developers were still concerned with the people who don't play as often and made sure the Stick of Truth was accessible to those new or less experienced. Stick of Truth is built as your classic RPG. The game begins with the choice of four classes, the fighter, the mage, the thief, and the um, <coughs> The Jew. The first three are pretty much the archetypes you'd expect from an RPG. The fighter has high HP and focuses on direct attacks that break armor and stun enemies. The mage can't take as many hits, but doles out large AOE damage and burning effects. The thief also can't take as many hits as the fighter, but the abilities of the thief can bypass armor and cause a bleed effect. Now the diversion from the norm is the Jew. This class works as a monk type, but the Jew becomes more powerful the more negative status effects are stacked on him. Scouring the game gets 
gets you plenty of weapons, armor, customization items, and money. Opening every available chest yields at least a few rewards, which feels progressive. Now, some of them do come in the way of objects that really only amount to more money, but when it could have just been a lazy pile of coins, they serve as a way to make more references to the source material with things like the very familiar looking TV award that the game values only at a few cents. The RPG tropes are all there. Although you don't see much in the way of innovation, you do see the unmistakable South Park twist on each. Outside of the amazing cutscenes, you're going to be spending most of your time in combat. Classically, there are regular attacks, abilities, magic in the form of farts, summons, and status effects. Regular attack effects depend on your weapons, most of which can be enhanced with things called strap-ons. Abilities use PP, a name Cartman refuses to change. <laughs> PP. <laughs> if you have a fucking better name for them than fucking say, Clyde, fucking asshole. You will battle alongside many of the South Park kids, each of which also have different attacks and abilities, which I really enjoy watching. And not a la Super Mario RPG, hitting the right button at the right time during an attack or defense increases the power of both. The nice thing is, it keeps you involved instead of just waiting for it to be over, but it can get a little monotonous nearer to the end, which leads into perhaps the main crux of battle, status effects. Attacking is all well and good, but stacking different effects on your opponents is the quickest way to dominate, and maybe almost too dominant. Bleed stacks do a ton of damage, grossed out prevents healing, stun stops attacks, and burn makes your farts do more damage. Most bosses also become a stackathon, and although some have immunity to different debuffs, there are plenty of others to use. Each turn you have the option to use an item and a skill, so death isn't incredibly threatening, and sometimes I think having to make the choice between reviving your ally or gambling for your next attack is a more thrilling gambit. HP and PP restore quickly after each battle. Therefore, I found myself almost completely full of support items already halfway through the game. On hard mode, the damage and health of enemies is increased, but I only noticed bosses were acting more aggressively instead to create a tougher battle. But it was mostly just a longer one as you, once again, sling abilities and wait for your status effects to do their job. Don't get me wrong, the combat is very fun to figure out, but once I did, I shredded. And if I'm going to be the Shredder, I'll occasionally need some spunky turtles to show me what's what. As an avid RPG fan, I wish the gameplay really went chest to chest with me. I don't mind dying a few, even several times before I figure something out. That being said, I also understand the idea that this is also for fans who may not play video games for a living. It's a great idea to give people the opportunity to sit back, relax, and feel involved in one of their favorite shows. And I'm sure many are just playing this game for the experience of the humor. But come on, Ubisoft, you made a hardcore mode. Go ahead, f*** me over a few times. Change the boss attack patterns. Take away the item plus attack option. Have status effects last shorter, maybe three stacks instead of five. Benefit of the doubt, maybe there wasn't enough time in development to really change the gameplay for hard mode, even though there was five years. But if there was, I'm a big boy now. I can handle it. I don't live with my stepmom anymore. She lives with me. Oh, Gerard, sweetie, dinner's ready. I made tacos! Oh, f yeah, tacos! Coming, mommy! The end of South Park The Stick of Truth is hilarious and fun. I found plenty of things to do, plenty to explore, and plenty to collect. Unfortunately, there is no reward for finding everything in the game. No post-game customization, ultimate weapons, or anything to encourage a second playthrough really, especially since hard mode is somewhat of a non-event. The unlocks really only happen in the game, and a total of 100% simply nets you the trophies. For better or for worse, the achievements really aren't too difficult, but if you aren't aware, a few are only obtainable once and without strategic saving, missing will necessitate an entire retread of the game, which isn't a huge deal since I rewatch South Park episodes all the time. But I can understand some frustration since collection can slow down the story and takes more time from getting due to your favorite moments. While I completed South Park The Stick of Truth, there were 12 hours of total playtime, two full playthroughs with one being hard mode, 51 trophies unlocked, 121 South Park characters friended on Facebook, and 84 uses of the word f There's no real way to measure comedy. Some people like family safe stuff, some like edgy stuff, clever, screwball, 
pond, slapstick, or cerebral. It's not my place to say whether or not you're supposed to find Stick of Truth funny, but I can tell you it came out feeling the way a South Park game should. Maybe it's a tad bit easy for experienced players, but it successfully matches the look, tone, pacing, and creativity for which the show is known. Every corner of the game reeks of Matt, Trey, and farts. So if you were looking to see what the show is about, South Park The Stick of Truth feels like an interactive best of and would make a great entry point into the series. Aside from nitpicky gag-based achievements that make completing Stick of Truth a little bit of a pain, this game is definitely worth your time. South Park The Stick of Truth is a fascinating game that isn't just a bunch of poop and dick jokes across the board. There's a lot of depth in the gameplay, a pretty fun but basic story, and tons of references to the South Park lore and realm of this incredible universe of a show. Casual and hardcore gamers will both love this game. You really kind of only lose out if you've never watched or appreciated an episode of South Park. That's the only downside of playing South Park The Stick of Truth, but then again, if you've never seen an episode of The Simpsons, you could still probably enjoy The Simpsons games over the years, right? I think it's a very palpable thing. And in this case, South Park The Stick of Truth does it right as a video game. For completionists, this game is not that hard to complete. You've got a couple of trophies to go through and a second playthrough on hard mode, but other than that, this is a pretty easy platinum trophy for your collection. So with that in mind, guys, I give this game my completionist rating of complete it. Complete That's all time we have for today, guys. So please, as always, let me know what you thought about today's episode somewhere on the internet. Don't forget to sign up for our SNES Classic giveaway by clicking the Gleamio link in the description down below, or it's on screen right now. A massive, massive, massive big hug and thank you to our patrons to the right. These guys are the reason why we're still here each and every week, completing now two games a week almost. It's really because of them that we're still going and really because you guys at home who are still watching the show, it means a lot. Thank you so much. If you missed last week's episode on Shadows of Mordor, here's the link right here. You can click or tap that. I've been Gerard the Completionist, and if you want to subscribe, you can do that as well. I'll see you next week for another brand new episode of The Completionist. See you later.